Hi friends, State Representative Eric Lucero and Mary Franzen for another edition of the right view, MN, where we never have the wrong view. Exactly. How are you today? Great, great. Awesome. It's uh, what are we concluding? Week number six of the 2019 legislative session. Doing good work. Absolutely, we are. Every day, every day we're shuffling. You know, even though we're in the minority, we're still uh, working hard for the mm -hmm. the great citizens of Minnesota. That's Absolutely. for sure. Absolutely. What's up with this weather? Another another week of climate change. Well, <laughs> um, my kids were let out of school two hours early today because of the weather, and I get to drive home in it soon. So. You know, I met with a superintendent of one of the school districts that I uh, represent, and she was telling me how it is very stressful having to get up at 3 a.m to go and drive the bus routes to make sure everything is going to be yeah. safe in order to make the call by 5 a.m. Right. And with this weather for the last three weeks, it has not been easy. So our hats off to the, the school administrators and school officials that are working hard to keep our children safe. So Absolutely. Thank you, bus drivers, too, Absolutely. for the work that you do. It is very stressful uh, driving in these weather conditions, but we salute you. So related to that did you know i was a former school bus driver no i did not what <laughs> haven't you done actually i know a, a little bit about your education history but wow school bus driver i bet you were a real hoot i was uh well <laughs> you know i was a stickler and I'll tell, so the question that i'll ask is so of a, so i drove kindergarten through mm -hmm. high school okay and so which grade do you think was the most i wouldn't say grade which uh, whether kindergarten, elementary, middle school, or high school, okay. of those four, which is the most difficult? High school. Wrong. They were the easiest. Really? They're, they get on, they sit on the bus, they don't care, they don't talk to anybody, they're the easiest. The most rowdy and difficult, by far, middle school. Mm, okay. By far. Absolutely. Well, this week, we had uh, several things come out. Mm -hmm. Minlars was among them. So for those uh, who may not recall, MinLars was the replacement database for our driver and vehicle services for driver's license and vehicle titles. There's been an incredible pain. A report by the legislative auditor was released this week and the findings are... Not good. That's right. Despite the claims of lack of money and lack of uh, time, the report definitively stated that that was not the case. There was m enough money, enough time. The problem was lack of accountability during Governor Dayton and Demo the Democrat administration. Uh, and, and to think, uh, Representative Lucero, that the same government that wants to control our health care thinks that they're going to be able to do this when they can't even do driver's license effectively That's, and on budget and on time. You know, if you wanted to get screwed up, if you want prices to go higher and mm -hmm. quality to go lower, have government get involved. Yeah. That's Absolutely. the rule of thumb. Uh, another was unfortunate lawsuit uh, continuation by Governor Waltz uh, regarding the oil line three in northern Minnesota that would create tremendous jobs. In the for, Iron Range. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so there was a lawsuit that was initiated by the Department of Commerce under uh, Governor Dayton's administration. That lawsuit was thrown out by a technicality. And the decision the, uh, for Governor Waltz to uh, whether he was going to not refile or to refile was i think it was tuesday this week tuesday or wednesday and he decided that unfortunately he was going to continue so that uh, is not good for minnesota no but what's shocking is <clears throat> i was kind of reading some uh, scuttlebutt taking place online and governor walls chose to ignore the phone calls from those in the affected area from the line three mm. uh talking about why this was a good project for the area and the jobs that would bring to the iron range right uh instead governor walls listened to the outside groups uh the extremists the environmentalists uh metro centric managing, yes the metro folks you know the metro folks would rather build cabins in the iron range and they want it for their little vacation spot meanwhile those that actually live on the iron range and um, they have to live there right That's they right. need jobs uh and of course they want to protect the environment uh but sadly uh governor walls has decided to side with the the metro centric people and much of the chagrin of the Iron Range, yeah, we'll which is in happens. part why we're seeing it continue to turn red Absolutely. with every and election cycle. 2020 is going to show even uh, the Iron Range even going more red. That's and we right. saw that with uh, Representative Rarick turning into That's Senator right. Rarick now. So. Yep, yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a, uh, spe a Spotlight Special Guest of the Week. And we sure do. this week it is, drum roll, Representative Nick Zerwas. Woohoo! Thanks for joining us today. Do you hear the crowd going wild? I why are you going wild? <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. Nice to well, see you. Well, happy Valentine's Day. We have a present for you. 
on this very special Valentine's yes, Day. Yes, Valentine. Now, for those at home, I'm sure most know, but for mm -hmm. those who may not, Nick, our representative of Zerwas, is known as the Candy Man, right? Mm -hmm. And we're all, a pro yeah, exactly. See? I got candy. Mm -hmm. a proc we're about the same age within a few years of each other yep. so we grew up mostly in the 80s yes and so as a, a product of the 80s we have 80s candy memorabilia oh. okay but now we have to go through it okay let's quickly go through it exactly. because there's some funny stuff in here <laughs> so this is the stuff that so oh. children of the modern era oh. may not oh this one is open but look at this candy stuff <laughs> candy cigarettes <laughs> yeah let's see what else we got here Oh. Yeah. yeah. Now, one of the things that uh, Pop Ooh. Rocks. Yep. Pop I love the rocks. Pop Rocks. And the Warheads, these are awesome. The wax, uh, the wax pop bottles. Oh. You know, when I was in Boy Scouts and we went up to Mini Point. Oh, push pop. <laughs> oh. So and when I was in favorite. Boy Scouts. Yeah. Big League Chew. Big League Chew well, now. Some of it did not come in the box, so I picked up uh, a couple of these items right <laughs> and we threw them in there so but the bubble gum fun. tape oh, that's, that's like, one of my favorite growing up too. the i don't even know what you call this it's but it was a necklace. necklace yeah a candy yeah. necklace there you go and there was one more in here that really caught my Wait. attention it was the dip in dip and oh yeah mm -hmm. the fun dip <laughs> <laughs> oh do you want any of these wait i get to pick one sure well, I thought the whole thing was for him. Well, this... well I wanted oh. to keep some for myself. Oh, you but... did? Oh, okay. That's... Well, you did purchase them. Can I take them? Totally. Chew? Totally. Mm -hmm. Take that, my gums. <laughs> exactly. Isn't that great? Oh, wait. Wait. Is this from the 80s? Am I going to die? No. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I don't care. It's worth it. <laughs> I'm Isn't so that excited. Fun? Oh, this yeah. is great. Okay. Well, that's fun. So... so Representative Zerwas, so what is going on in your world? Well, just really quickly, I, I heard you talking about line three. And I think for me, one of the most concerning things about the governor's announcement is he also uh, unveiled something new when mm. it comes to this permitting process. Mm -hmm. You're right. Remember, this line three process has been going on for over a year. It went through the PUC process permitting process, the Public Utility Commission permitting process, every member of the PUC serving right now was appointed by Governor Dayton. Mm. When it went through, it was approved five to zero. Unanimous, yep. It was unanimous approval by left-leaning liberal Public Utility Commissioners. That's right. They said, they issued what's called a certificate of need. Mm -hmm. And they said, this project meets all the requirements. They've jumped through the environmental hoops and you get the certificate of need and the permit. <sighs> what's scary is the governor has now said, for projects like this, there will also be a social permit. What does that look that's like? That's required. It seems kind of pie in the sky. To make sure that a project is socially right for uh, Minnesota. Yeah, well, and, and when they say Minnesota, the one Minnesota, who is it supposed to be socially right for? Well, clearly left-leaning environmental extremists. activists yes. and extremists. Mm -hmm. And not even just that, um, a ton of out-of-state pressure coming in on this issue, too. The same group of agitators and protesters that camped out and left tens of thousands of dollars worth of cleanup costs mm -hmm. in North Dakota have now have their eyes set on Minnesota. So this is something that we're gonna have to watch dramatically. There is nothing in statute, in rulemaking, any of the agencies about social permitting mm -hmm. or how, let's just say you have a project that could employ thousands of Minnesotans right. with billions of dollars of investment. There is nothing written down about how to get a social permit. Yeah, exactly. This is an absolute farce. Yes. Just an overreach and a continued example of how uh, administrative rulemaking, but in this case, it's not even that. It's just whole cloth. Yes. Whole cloth. Speaking of farce, you've got a couple of uh, good bills to counter some of the fraud stuff. Well, so obviously, uh, Representative, uh, you have been working 
significantly uh, over the interim and into the session on CCAP fraud and what was starting to come out mm -hmm. um, at the end of last session. And we saw just this week um, the Office of the Legislative Auditor indicate that his audit is going to be pushed back uh, for probably, it sounds like, a month or more. And so session is moving forward. We need to act to try to do everything we can to rein in this uh, child care fraud. Well, and so I happened to get a USB uh, last week with this data dump or two, a week and a half ago. With As a part of your data dump. request. Yeah, yes. Thousands of pages. So what was found in there is a memo to me from the department, which was fascinating. It says that uh, DHS first identified unusual activity in its CCAP program in late 2010. Wow. Wow. Yeah. What year is this? 2019. <laughs> okay, 2018. 2019. Yeah. 2019. <laughs> As a result of these investigations, are you ready? In 2014, DHS learned that money had been wired from some daycare providers that received CCAP funds to the banks in the Middle East. These wire transfers took place between 2014 and mid-2015. Now, if this is 2019, why are we just learning about this now? And why has the department hired an outside firm to investigate its own fraud employees? Well, and that's the most uh, troubling uh, uh, turn of events in all this is the Department of Human Services operates the Office of Inspector General. The Office of Inspector General issued a pretty scathing report about fraud and the likelihood that money obtained through the CCAP program was then being transferred through these money orders to uh, countries in Africa and the Middle East, in some instances with connections to terrorist That's operations right. uh -huh. uh, overseas. And These are Minnesota, hardworking Minnesota taxpayer dollars yes. that are going overseas. It's and, absolutely outrageous. And the department, instead of saying, oh my God, we got we a problem. To, we gotta stop this. Mm -hmm. Their answer, as Representative Francis pointed out, their answer was to say, hey, you stop investigating this. We're going to hire a private contractor to investigate the investigators because we think you're being culturally insensitive. Um, you know, that, you can't, can't make, make this up. up. And no. at the same time, there are groups right now, and I'm sure you've met, the both of you have met with them, that are walking around demanding tax increases. And my response to them is, and has been, there are hundreds of millions of dollars that have been potentially uncovered of waste, fraud, and abuse in a myriad of programs. Yep. We don't this have is, a revenue problem. This is just one program. Yeah, exactly. And that same program today, the lieutenant governor has come out and said that she wants to um, increase the reimbursement rate of the CCAP program and get about 1,000 kids off the wait list. And I say not one, men one penny more toward that um, program until we can start addressing kind of fix this the, stuff. That's the just, fraud in the program I, and bring integrity back into right. the program. And you've got a couple of bills. So we do. Mm -hmm. um, they're so common sense and they make so much sense, I couldn't get a single Democrat to sign on to the bill with me. Hey, I'm in the same boat with my They bill. all, they looked at me, they said, this has to do with daycare fraud, and they turned around and walked away. <laughs> I you know, you know I'm laughing, but that's sad. Because this sad. isn't a partisan issue. No. It's Fraud yeah. should not be a partisan issue. Exactly. So the first bill that we're working on seems very common sense. It says, if a family receiving CCAP money or a daycare center uh, receiving CCAP money um, is convicted <laughs> of fraud, not accused, now we think it's bad, but convicted yep of fraud, that makes them ineligible for the CCAP program. Yeah. So what this bill says is, hey, we should probably not let them have access to other child care taxpayer dollars, like early learning scholarships. But are you sure there's no cultural insensitivity in the language of your bill? You know what, I, I fully believe that there's enough, fraud. there's enough fraud to go around, mm -hmm. and there's fraud in this program that is occurring across the state.
Mm-hmm. That's right. I, 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 am, I am fully convinced of that. Uh, in my early conversations with the legislative auditor, Jim Nobles, I think one of the things he will state uh, in his audit when it's been pushed back, when it's released next month, hopefully, is that this program was almost designed to have fraud committed. And so all we're saying is if you are convicted of CCAP fraud, yep. you cannot apply for other tax You're disqualified, yep. In a different program. You've demonstrated your, your lack of integrity to receiving benefits from Minnesota taxpayers. You're off the rolls. But yeah, that seems common sense. And so couldn't get a single Democrat to sign out of that bill. Wow. The, the second bill that we're working on that will uh, be dropping next week um, has to do with a guarantee of protecting taxpayer dollars. There are huge daycare centers uh, that take in tons of the CCAP money on an annual basis. If and when we find out, hey, you're taking in a lot of money, but you're not actually taking care of that many kids, and you are committing CCAP fraud, nine times out of 10, what we're finding out is that money is gone. Yep. There is no recovering that money. It is. They are ordered restitution, but. They're ordered restitution, but it's like, you know, getting blood out of a turnip. Well, happen. look at Yasmin Ali. She's missing. Yeah, she missing. fled She fled the country mm-hmm. and all of the money is gone. Yep. So what we're saying is if you operate a, a daycare program that takes in more than a quarter million dollars a lot of, money. of CCAP funds a year. So imagine the size of operation mm-hmm. we're talking about. We're saying at that point, you have to get a surety bond. You have to get a bond that says, if it comes out, if it turns out that this money wasn't going to the right place mm-hmm. and you were committing fraud, we then have a bond agency to go back and recover the taxpayer's loss. Now, Eric, in your background with construction, you are very familiar with the idea. A lot of hard-working Minnesotans that are contractors are very familiar That's right. with the concept of having bonds that you have to guarantee the delivery to protect. of That's your work. Right. And I was actually you were mentioning that. I was thinking we're both former city council members. Yes. And when developers would come, there a bond is required to protect the taxpayers of the city. And so this is another common sense a piece of legislation it to be clear it does not limit access to daycare it is a nominal nominal fee if you can prove that you're an upstanding operation an upstanding business then it's a nominal fee to get a $250,000 surety bond but what this does so much more efficient than government because it would turn over to the private sector Mm -hmm. the validation that what you're running as a daycare operation is a valid operation. Mm -hmm. Because clearly, we can't count on the department to audit operations and check in on this. So, Fantastic idea. By putting it on the private sector and having to get them issue a bond, any bonding agency is going to do their due diligence. And guess what? If you don't have kids actually coming to your daycare center, they will not issue you that bond, and you will never, ever get your feet off the ground. That's the inverse of what I said earlier in this video. If you want to guarantee government, or if you want increase, uh, increases in cost, decreases in quality, go government route. But the inverse of that is if you want guaranteed higher quality at lower, more efficient costs, Count in the private sector, and that's Absolutely. what free market forces do. And that's what this solution would do. Fantastic. Good well, for you, Nick. Thank that's, you. No, I'm excited about it. Yeah, we're, we're we need doing to keep some these really conversations. Absolutely. Minnesotans are very mad about this. Mm-hmm. I know there's stories related to this that have been broken in the last couple of years, and yeah, yep. Minnesotans are demanding. Well, we got some days at the Capitol. Yeah, some exciting uh, days at the Capitol next week. So Tuesday is Disability Day at the Capitol. Listen, that is a very important day. Uh, we had on the House floor, what, 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 what through committee this week was um, a 7% cut that was made permanent, codified, uh, something that the Republicans had been looking to reinstate for the past couple yep. of years, uh, which the Democrat administration under Dayton was spending that money. We'd have to recoup that money from his budget and repurpose it where it was supposed to go. Yeah, unfortunately, the Democrats um, are putting through a bill to cut... Um, 
group home workers, home and community based mm -hmm. service workers, individuals that take care of the most vulnerable Minnesotans. And it just it's immoral to hear it is immoral. To to cut their wages by seven percent. And uh, it was a very contentious debate in committee. We tried to stop that on the floor of the House today, and sadly, every Democrat that was uh, on the floor of the House today voted to go forward uh, yeah. to cut those workers, cut their raise or their uh, pay by 7%. Just unconscionable. And, and people that are helping, uh, the unfortunate people that are disabled, they have such big hearts, and it's a huge sacrifice, and it is... It's a 24-hour it's a job. It, it is. I it, live next to two group homes. One's right next door to me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, the, and the work is so unbelievably challenging. Yeah. Literally getting individuals out of bed, helping bathe them, dress them, uh, take care of their daily needs. Yep. Um, it is a demanding, demanding, challenging job. And, uh, you know, you, Democrats like to position themselves as the big hearts and, and oh, we just want to give back and, and help everyone. Um, this is another example of especially when it comes to the disability community. Mm -hmm. um, these folks are not interested in looking out for the least among us. They are just not. Yeah, so unfortunate. Thursday, Salvation, uh, uh, Salvation, Salvation Army, Army Day. Day at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And Saturday, we have our Second Amendment rally that's from right. 11 to 12.30. That is February 23rd, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. That's the Goker rally, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Minnesota yeah. Gun Owners Caucus. Oh, the Gun Owners Caucus. Perfect. That's also Rob my Dorr. son's 12th birthday. So you're going to celebrate uh, with Sal? I'll be at home. Yeah, I have a BPOU convention uh, as well that morning oh, and yep, then yep. Uh, son's birthday. Mm -hmm. Well, that is something we know that our Second Amendment rights are under assault. Yes. So all law-abiding gun owners come down to the Capitol this Saturday. I intend to be there. Hope to see you there as well because we Sorry, need to stand up. Way. Yeah, exactly. What I was going to say earlier when I was uh, I played uh, uh, baseball when I was in middle school and uh, that's what we uh, would... Very popular, wasn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Remember yeah. the shredded jerky? Yes. <laughs> oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, it was so good in these little plastic... I'm so happy right now. <laughs> well, thank you, Representative Zerwas, for coming yes, by. Yes, thank you for your are time you, today. Are you kidding me? Now that I know there's candy down here. <laughs> and Representative Franzen, you have a good weekend. Yes, you too, thank you. And that's a wrap.